had uh, been sort of a casual Stephen King fan. Um, I had read a few of the books, but I think uh, my biggest enthusiasm had been through Carrie first, you know, and Stand By Me, and The Shining, and um, Misery. Those were really successful adaptations, I thought. Can we get Tim here, too? Through here? This new book, it sounded, the material sounded like something I could relate to, you know, friends who were sort of dissatisfied with their life. Married to an extraordinary, you know, Stephen King development, you know, the invasion of aliens from another world. And I thought, well, you know, that's like one of my movies, but with the thing I really want to do now, which is something more, you know, something bigger. 20, Frank, take one. Be only mark. Whatever it's hard. The movie starts with meeting the four friends who have been friends since childhood. And one of the events that um, absolutely sealed their friendship when they were young was their saving in childlike heroic circumstances. Um, a fifth child. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Hey, you guys! Quit! The fifth child, the mentally challenged child, helps them take on qualities which are beyond nature, which are supernatural, which are superpowers. It is a challenge to take a book this long and complicated and full of so many flights of fancy and make a good movie. Because movies are always a reduction of any good novel. William Goldman had done an adaptation already when I came onto the project. This is the third King I did. I did Misery and I did Hearts in Atlantis and now Dreamcatcher. Bill came out and we did one more draft with him doing the writing. Through this process, his first draft, his second draft with me, and then me taking it over the writing, I tried to take the best of what Bill Goldman had done and then bring back those things in the book that he felt he couldn't deal with and I felt we could, and try to have the movie be as big and embracing and yet clear and entertaining as it could be. Let's go. Wow. Let's go. Stand by and Pete. rolling. Pete. Rolling. And action. When you read the book, you say, all right, I'm going to make a movie out of this. You know you're headed to some very cold place and that the filmmaking itself is going to be an adventure. We were 27 below sometimes. Out, we were 500 miles north of Vancouver in British Columbia in the middle of winter. We were very fortunate. A lot of the crew was Canadian and had worked in those kind of conditions. And the crew set a wonderful example for the cast in terms of not complaining and being there and, and working through very difficult conditions. We were working through the night a lot of the time. And so just getting out there, you know, you have to gird yourself for that kind of temperature and, and we're making snow or there's real snow. and. And so you have these huge fans blowing on you when it's already sub-zero temperatures. And then you have to act through that. I don't know what everybody was talking about, you know, and a lot of actors get a bad rap for being, you know, maybe complaining or a little whining or something, but I think this is, this is great beer drinking weather, if you ask me. Picture, nice and quiet, everybody. I said, Mom, Stephen King. Dreamcatcher. She said, do it. I said, what part should I play? She said, Henry. So um, that's the part I'm playing. And my mom told me to do it. Damien Lewis. Not Daniel Day Lewis. I played Jonesy. I'm an associate professor of history at a college in Boston. He, of course, at the beginning of the movie, he gets run down. He gets knocked over. Which is... Um, the first time Stephen King wrote of his experience of being knocked down, uh, or at least in traumatic form. Camera lock, camera lock. He gives that retelling of his own life to Jonesy. So it's Jonesy that gets hit. At the premiere. Yes. Don't, when I say, Mom, this is Daniel Day, yeah. don't go run with it. It'll mean run a lot to me, it'll mean a lot to her. <laughs> There's a real story here about 
real people that we can all kind of relate to. But the bigger picture is what uh, is the most frightening. There's a big cloud kind of looming overhead. I'm action star Jason Lee. Hey, Marker. We made some pretty good character choices. A little bit of a pompadour, the Buddy Holly glasses, the toothpick holder. I think they wanted me to have long hair at first. And then I thought, well, I think maybe Beaver likes oldies music. I feel so bad, I've got a worried mind. I thought that was a good choice. And the fact that Larry let me do that was kind of cool. I don't know of an actor that would say no to working with him. He is an actor's director. They all love him. And they'll do anything for him. There's an outrageous aspect to the Dreamcatcher story, and it has to do with these creatures growing within the people. Damien, when you're revealed, you should be as far back as possible, because he had a big lead on you from there. When the alien enters this cabin, it enters within a stranger who wanders in, and that's a familiar Stephen King motif. It's a familiar horror motif, which is that someone or something that looks innocent brings with it, you know, some horrible parasite. 46, 47, one mark. P mark. Action. The sequence in the bathroom is maybe the most fun sequence I've ever done, and also the goriest and grossest and creepiest. Rick, you okay? I'm a little sick, fellas. I just need to make a little room. He's in the bathroom, and he's locked the bathroom, and there's an almighty noise coming from there, and we try to get in, and... Uh... Oh, fuck! Oh, man! Fuck! I don't want to see this, Jonesy. Man, I can't see this. Shut up a minute. The bathroom is actually very small. We were able to get three cameras in there all the time, and we'd be crammed in there trying just to fit. I think it can go about here, yeah. and we can shoot under it. I think the multiple camera situation had to happen on this to get a multitude of angle changes for the editor to be able to use them. In the first act, it's all about people. It's all about relationships. and. And then all of a sudden you get to, you know, the bathroom scene and it's, it's sort of, whoa, you know, it's obviously a visual effect, it's an alien. But you wonder, will we be able to pull it off to make this seem as real as the rest of the movie? Can you see it on the monitor, Jeff? Jeff, go a little tighter. Go a little tighter with yours. There we go. That's the challenge about this, visual effects-wise. I mean, these have to look like real creatures in your bathroom, but they're aliens. There are two big ideas that are difficult to put into movies. One is that the alien invades one of the protagonist's body in a way that doesn't destroy him, but in fact, he uses the human's body to get around on Earth to do the work he's trying to do. I run around being two people. It's terrifying, confusing. It's an exhausting day at work. The decision was made by Larry very early that that should be entirely a matter of performance on Damien Lewis's part. You're not. Oh, shut up, Pete. You're too messed up to know what you're saying. Too late for that. Pete, I need you to get onto the snowmobile right now. There is no makeup. There is no prosthetic. It's entirely a matter of acting and behaving. Jonesy. What are you up to? The other difficult idea for a movie is that all our memories and all our experiences have been warehoused and kept in what essentially is like a big library. Could you bring me enough to fill this box? Yeah, of those. John Hutman, the production designer, came through brilliantly with a circular design. And then Rosemary McCherry, the set designer, 
filled every shelf of, you know, multi-storied warehouse. King's description of the memory warehouse is really linear. And as Larry and I were talking about it, we like this idea of a spiral. That was the most challenging on a design level because, you know, I had to make it up. Dreamcatcher follows two stories, which is the story of the friends and what happens to them, and the story of the military and how they're dealing with the alien invasion. And there are two good characters at the heart of that part of the story. Stop! 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 Tell him! Tell him! Tell him! Tell him! You go to the movies, you see the work that people do, you know, you see actors, you see the directors, and you say, oh man, I'd like to work with that one. Can you shoot somebody in here? You got the new pages? I got them, I didn't realize. I'm here primarily because I want that's what I wanted. I wanted to work with Larry Caster, so. All right, and Morgan? Scout Sonner. Scout Sonner. This is called a motion picture. Okay? Stephen King has a child, a son named Owen, which uh, gave me a, a little in to what's going on here. Rolling because of my relationship with Morgan Freeman in the movie is a father-son relationship. You were excellent out there, O. You made me feel very proud. But Larry wrote the part of Owen for me. He tailored it to my strengths, what he thinks I'm best at or good at. Down, that's Larry. Owen doesn't die in this movie. He wouldn't die if it was me. The Dreamcatcher, which is this Indian charm that hangs above beds or in rooms to catch nightmares and keep them away from you and let the good dreams come through, is Stephen King's central metaphor, you know, and the way I designed the Dreamcatcher in response to that is that there's a central circle and then four smaller circles around it representing the friends, but the central circle represents this character Duddits, who is the mentally challenged child that they save when they're 13 years old. When you actually see him grown up to the same age as the other protagonist, he's very sick, dying, you know, near the end of his life. I'm a... Duddits, to be honest, really moved me more than anything else or anyone else in the story. Jonesy's gonna, he'll be dead, the monster, and Jonesy will be Jonesy, and I can say I've done it, and then... I think he reminded me of myself in a way. He reminded me of, of who I am and what and what I am. And uh, I think what I am is I, I, I'm full of love, you know, and I I'm, try to be supportive to people and I try to help people. Donnie embraced that part and went out of his way to look sickly and to lose the weight and to shave his head and take extreme measures on the makeup. and. Um, I think it's quite effective. Special uh, makeup people like Bill Corso come in to make me look less handsome. It takes a lot. In the case of our pal uh, Duddits, we take a good-looking fellow like Donnie Wahlberg and try to transform him into what's represented in Stephen King's book. Oh, Mr. Gay. That, I think, is probably my favorite transformation in the movie because you're trying to create a character who doesn't exist but yet so exists when you're finished with his performance and with the makeup. Every sequence, no matter what kind of movie you're making, it's a question of frames, you know, another three frames here and another three frames less here. Could you hang on a couple more frames? Sure, Let yeah. me see the bottles fly. Sure. And then do it again mm -hmm. in the car. Well, I think Larry wanted to do two things in the beginning. He wanted to give the feeling of something like The Shining, where you really know that something is imminent, that this movie has a different scope than what you're expecting initially. And he wanted to follow this line of, of setting up the story very carefully in, in blocks and in moods. So you would follow each character as they met each other, and you realize that they're friends, and then bit by bit you're drawn and you're reeled into this movie that's really quite frightening. I don't want to see this, Josie. Man, I can't see this. Shut up. Now, I think is one of the best entrances of a monster in the movie, this sort of out-of-focus shot as he puts on the glasses. 
they had talks about what's going to be done musically as an idea and with sound. Mm -hmm. And Bob went to the location in Prince George and recorded not only all the military equipment and that sort of thing, but he started getting an idea for the voice of our characters, of our creatures. The sounds come from everywhere. We take all those elements, slow them down, reverse them, do something to them to, to make them sound more monster-esque. And we start creating this monster and bringing it to life. So, you know, it's quite a challenge. The sound of the movie goes arm in arm with the special effects because this, this creature doesn't really exist and yet it's crawling, it's, it's screaming. <laughs> Everything is articulated to the nth degree so that when that thing opens its mouth and gets ready to strike, you just, you're there. When I um, got to know James, I just felt that I had found the guy that uh, was best for me to work with, you know, where the communication is always perfect. And when we came to Dreamcatcher, um, you know, I said, I want it to be weird. I don't want there to be a clear distinction all the time between the sound effects and the music. My original intent, and one I've adhered to pretty strongly throughout, is that there would be it would be a lot of sound design, a lot of electronics. It's a lot more electronics than I, pro I think I've ever done in any movie. Um, and I've adhered to that, and I've tried to make it much more textural, less thematic, not melodic. A lot of times the music is working on a very subtle level. My hope is that people will oftentimes not even be aware that it's there. It's, it's mixed in with the uh, Bob Grieve sound design. In many ways, Dreamcatcher was the most fun of any movie I've done, and I didn't expect it. I knew it was going to be very physically challenging, but it was just joyful. The people that I brought with me, the cast and the crew. What's going on out here? All the people that went out in sub-zero weather. It's only 22 below two today. It was the essence of what I like about filmmaking, which is that you get a bunch of strangers together and they have to work as a unit. And then at the end of this intense experience, you're not strangers anymore. Don't ever shoot me when my hat isn't good. 